Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today's guest is the creator of Food Forest Abundance, Jim Gale. Jim has lived a diverse and multifaceted life so far. At age 19, he first learned about the power of writing his goals. From the practice of inspired visioning, he became a four-time All-American and national champion wrestler. After a period of global travel, he was ready for his next challenge. He wrote his goals again at age 29, which included being retired in three years. Jim went on to create a mortgage company that reached $1.3 billion in sales in three years, leading him to early retirement and the achievement of another life goal. He bought a boat, lived on the ocean for a year, and then moved to Costa Rica to build eco-villages, where he discovered permaculture. It changed his life, and he realized he needed to bring it to every household in the world. From this idea grew Food Forest Abundance. If you enjoyed today's episode, please consider leaving us a five-star rating and a warm review at the top of the show page on Spotify or at the bottom of the show page if you are listening on Apple Podcast. Your opinions matter, and your ratings help us to grow and help more people to be healthy, find freedom of body and mind, and to live their dreams. And now here is Paul with Jim Gale talking about food security now. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Our title today is Food Security Now. We're going to have a very interesting conversation with a very interesting man, Jim Gale. Jim was referred to me by, God, a number of people. Your name kept popping up, Jim. And, uh, you know, I have a lot of students out there in the world that are into all these kinds of things. And I started getting emails, and usually by the time I get the third email suggesting the same guy, I go, okay, it's time to look into this. So I snooped around, and we made contact by email. Actually, I think Autumn Smith might have recommended me to you. Do you know Autumn Smith? Um, I know the name, and I know J.P. Sears also, I think, uh, made the connection. Right. Okay, yeah. Well, you know, J.P. was a student of mine and one of my instructors for many years. Yes, that's what he said. That's wonderful. He was my protege for five years. He worked directly with me in the institute in my clinic and gym and where we saw patients and people from all over the world. And so, yeah, a recommendation from JP. I don't need to think twice. I always trust those. But then I started looking at videos and things, and I found your Dell Bigtree interview, which I was just talking about, and Penny uh, liked it too. And I thought it was just beautiful and really made some very important points, uh, which I know you do repeatedly, but it was really nice to see the transformation of his yard from just grass into something that really contributes, contributed to his and contributes to anyone's sustainability for all the reasons we'll get into today. So I'd like to say welcome and thank you for everything you're doing out there. I think it's amazing. Well, thank you, Paul. I'm so glad to be here. I'm honored to be here. I've researched your work and know one of you for quite a while. And I'm a big fan of the breathing and the movement and the mindset, right? That's what it's going to take to shift the world. And what we'll discuss on this show today are the solutions to all of the world's biggest problems. And that's not a hypothetical statement, but that's an actually proven and demonstrated statement all over the world. And we're going to get down into the nitty gritty today. Right on. Well, as I mentioned, I watched your video with Dell Bigtree and loved what you did. Um, I also enjoyed hearing the story of your background and how you got into permaculture. I think that was quite interesting because you came from a very unrelated field, which is always interesting when someone, you know, it's like a musician who becomes a rocket scientist or something. You're like, how did that happen? You know? So maybe we can start off with you sharing that story with our listeners so they can get a sense of who you are and what values guided your life and do guide your life that are, you know, really, the, so they get a sense of the man that really is promoting permaculture and, and helping so many people create real health and sustainability from the ground up. Wonderful. Well, I grew up in Minnesota and they called me Nature Boy. We moved when I was about eight or nine years old. We moved to this house that was kind of close to a lake, kind of overlooking a lake. And I was in the water knee deep all summer long, fishing, catching frogs and turtles and had baby ducks and pigeons. I loved nature and I love nature to this day. And 
In fact, my favorite, my only magazine subscription ever was Ranger Rick. And my favorite TV show was Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. And I used to wait all week for that show because it blew my mind. Um, then after, uh, I, and then I got into wrestling when I was about nine years old. And that sport taught me a lot. It taught me, well, when it really started teaching me is when I first wrote my goals. And so I went through high school. I actually had my biggest failure of my life when I was a junior in high school. I, I got third in the state as a sophomore. And then my junior year, I was rated first all year long. And the end of the year, the big match, the state finals, and it was Jerry Martin and I. We were born on the same day, Christmas Eve, 19, 1969. And I'd wrestled them five times. And I had beat them every time. And it kept getting closer and closer and closer. Well, the sixth time he was wrestling to win and I was wrestling to not lose. And I lost. Right. Yeah. And then I went through two years of not really knowing what I was going to do. I kind of just, I was just floating along. And then I got to uh, Mankato State, Minnesota, MSU. And the college wrestling coach, Dr. Gary Rushing, told the whole team, said, team, it was a Friday afternoon. I'll never forget it. He gave us all this packet of paper and he said, it's time to write your goals. And I looked at that and I was like, oh, yuck, that seems like homework to me. And I didn't like homework. In fact, to this day, I think of my ADD as my most precious gift. Good idea. <laughs> yeah, right? I, I don't want to be programmed. I want to think my own thoughts. <laughs> I, tell, I tell all the people that come to me, which is many that say, and even in my classes, oh, I've got ADD, I have a hard time learning. Or people come to me, I have ADD, blah, blah, blah. I say, look, don't ever say that to me again. Replace those words with, I have a unique learning style and learn how to work with your learning style and your follow your innate genius. And when you become the person that your soul brought you here to be, you'll find that you have a way of learning that is so unique that makes you special that people will think it's a miracle that you do the things you do and they'll wonder why they can't do them. <laughs> that is so profound and so true. And the more I step into who I know I am at the core level, the more the magic happens. And, and we'll get into that in a bit because it's been pure magic for the last 15 months. Um, so I wrote my goals. Uh, in fact, I threw the paper on my desk and I was a procrastinator to the max back then because I didn't have a compelling future in my head. I just was going along and I threw them on my desk or my countertop, my dresser. And then on Sunday night, I had to get those in because the coach said, you cannot come to practice on Monday morning unless you have your goals written. So Sunday night, I'm like, oh gosh, I got to do those darn things. And I started writing. And as I started writing, the goals were written in questions. And I'm a big fan of questions over affirmations. I think questions affect us at a much more deeper subconscious level. And I started writing or asking the questions and then writing out things. And by the time I was done, about two and a half, three hours later, I was a different person. The person that left the wrestling room on Friday and the person that showed up on Monday morning were two very different people, at least Fantastic. with the, the, the energy that was in my body. I handed my uh, goals to the coach. He read them and he smirked and he sat back and he said, these goals are kind of lofty, don't you think? <laughs> <laughs> That's what they often say. Yes. And then he proceeded to tell me about goals being something that you can achieve right on the edge of your comfort zone. Well, I, I don't have a comfort zone. I just went all the way. And then four years later, I was a uh, national champion and four-time All-American inducted into the National Hall of Fame. And it was because I created that compelling future for myself. And the thing that really solidified it was about a month after writing these goals, it was time to elect a captain of the wrestling team. I was a freshman. And Doug James raised his hand and said, I nominate Jim Gale. And uh, somebody seconded that and it blew my mind. And so then I, because, you know, we can help create people by sharing with them their potential. And this is so much fun. And this is what you do is share with them what their potential is in a way that they feel it. Well, I lived up to that. 
And, and so that was just, that was a very pivotal moment in my life. That's beautiful. You know, there's an old saying, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. Yeah. So in my system, I broke it down into four steps. One, two, three, four. One, love. What do you love enough to change for, to become? Two, yin and yang are the two forces that create the universe. Where are you out of balance with those two forces? Three, there's only three choices you can ever make in relationship to any person, place, or thing. The optimal, which is the one that's best for everybody on your dream team. The suboptimal, which usually relates to instant gratification but causes problems on your dream team. Three, do nothing. Do nothing has positive applications. Do nothing when you've got to make an important choice but you need more information. Spend time gathering it. Don't make the choice till you have the information. Do nothing when you're having a heated discussion and you're feeling disconnected at the heart from somebody, call a timeout. Tell them, I, I need to take a break because I can't stay connected at my heart. Let's reconvene when I can be connected at the heart. And three, do nothing. The negative application is apathy, to not care. So ultimately, it's make a choice that's dream affirmative, but is also considering everybody that's involved. Suboptimal choices cause pain and, and disconnection, but you learn from them and do nothing when you need more information or you're feeling disconnected at the heart and don't become apathetic or your life will be miserable. <laughs> yes. Oh, gosh. That reminds me of so many instances in life where maybe I responded to an email that I was I should have done nothing. Right. It, right. Like, the one thing that I've learned out of many is never communicate angry. <laughs> right. There's no value. Then number four is the four doctors. Dr. Happiness. What is happy making for me that I'm willing to do every day to keep myself responsible for my happiness? Dr. Movement. How much movement do I need to be healthy and achieve my dream? Dr. Diet. How do I eat for my individual needs instead of listening to other people's diets? Pay attention to what my body's telling me. Dr. Quiet. How much rest do I need to live and love fully and be healthy and have time for introspection in my own spiritual practice? So what do I love enough to change for? Where am I out of balance? What choices am I willing to make in regard to my values around happiness, diet, quiet, and movement? If you get that right, you're impervious to health problems and you work through your challenges and you become what you intended to be. That's beautiful. I couldn't agree more. Um. You know, many have heard of organic farming and some have heard of biodynamic farming. My experience of teaching thousands and thousands of students is when the word permaculture comes up, most people don't know what it is. So can you define permaculture and highlight the differences between permaculture and other farming systems such as organic biodynamic? My father classified himself as a mixed farmer. He, 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 he stated that he likes to use the best of what he called science, which is chemicals and organic farming, which these days after a lifetime of study, I wouldn't agree with, but he still raised good food. Yeah. It kept us healthy. And then also, of course, commercial farming, which is a long ways from permaculture. But I just think to lay the foundation so people really know what it is that you do and what that word permaculture means, it would be nice to see the differences. I love it. So permaculture stands for permanent culture, which simply means sustainable culture, a culture that creates more energy than it takes to maintain, a culture that that sucks up the energy and mines the resources is unsustainable and all unsustainable systems die or fail at some point. So permaculture is really just an energy science, right? How do we look at the world in which we look at energy productive production systems, nature, God, source, all of these systems are all around us. You know, people talk about free energy and I just point to the sun. Like we got free energy everywhere, right? And yes. it's a, a matter of using that energy, working with that energy in a way that actually creates more energy and the permaculture design process, the principles are so amazing. And then the network is where really all the value is. The idea came from Bill Mollison and Jeff Lawton about 50 some years ago. And now the network is coming together and they're observing and interacting, interacting with natural systems and then asking questions like, 
okay, what works for this? What works for ground squirrels, right? How do we <laughs> keep the ground yeah. squirrels out? What works for deer? What plants work with each other and what plants hate each other, right? Or at least don't work well together. So permaculture, the millions of people in it around the world now have created these databases where we're bringing all of this information in and what we know for certain. In fact, this is where another place where my life changed. Um, I was going through a tough time when I was learning that we are absolutely destroying our world by poisoning on every level. Our soil, our air, our water, our minds, our stomachs, our souls. We're just poisoning and killing everything. And I went through this two years of intense study. I, I had sold a mortgage company that did about $1.3 billion in revenue in three and a half years. And I had time. And I had my first two daughters. That was the trigger for me to start looking at wor the world through a different lens, a more long-term lens, and asking the question, what's the world going to be like? And 10, 20, 30, 40 years. What's the world of my grandkids going to be like? And I, I went through that kind of dark period of, oh my gosh, I don't see a solution. And then I read Bill Mollison's quote, though the problems of our world are increasingly complex, the solutions remain embarrassingly simple. And I started to bawl. And from that day forward, that was 15 years ago, I have been obsessed with bringing these solutions to the masses. Thank God. There's a saying I teach all of my students. The pain is seldom where the actual problem is. For example, I've seen many cases of rotator cuff problems that wouldn't heal even after surgery. But what most doctors and therapists overlook is that the right shoulder is under influence from the liver and the left shoulder the stomach. Once we apply the principles of detoxification, support digestion, and clear parasites, presto, shoulders start healing and working beautifully again. If you learn to see people holistically, like I teach my students in Holistic Lifestyle Coaching Level 1, you begin to see the true source of our illnesses and injuries. HLC 1 teaches you many essential approaches to health and well-being, such as how to assess what key body systems are under too much stress and how to restore balance, the importance of identifying a realistic dream goal or objective that inspires each individual to stick to their healing program and make the short and long-term changes that are necessary, my universally applicable 1-2-3-4 formula for assessing and correcting challenges, how to breathe optimally to enhance energy levels and mental clarity, how to use gentle movements to work in and enhance life force energy and support optimal immune function, how the function and health of the soil that food is grown in influences all systems of the body, including our mental-emotional stability, and much more. HLC1 is just a small part of what we teach our Czech Academy students, our education system for elite trainers and health professionals. Gavin Jennings and I designed the academy to take you from wherever you are right now, even if you have no fitness or health education, to being one of the best holistic health and performance professionals on this planet. And as a Czech Academy student, you'll be able to help a lot of people reach their health goals in ways you never imagined. There is, in my opinion, nothing more rewarding and meaningful in life than helping other people look, feel, and live better. We are now accepting applications into the Czech Academy, so whether you're wanting to change your career or add a truly effective new dimension to your current skill set, now is the time to apply. Go to chekinstitute.com forward slash L number 4D Academy. That's checkinstitute.com forward slash L4D Academy. Let's make the world a better place together. You know, it's interesting you mentioned energy because then, you know, I've done countless uh, presentations and webinars and conference hall presentations on soil science and how critical that is to physical, emotional, mental, and even spiritual health. And in my research, I came across, I don't know what book it was because it's been many years, but I was looking at the definition of energy and the standard physics definition is the capacity to do work. But I was studying, uh, I believe it was a biodynamics farming book, and the definition given there was in a farming system, the definition of energy is the ability to maintain order. And so I thought, well, that's a really cool thing because when the farm is organized correctly and all the systems are supporting each other, then the energy circulates 
And it's more than just doing work because work is the dissipation of energy. But, you know, I teach what I call, I develop this concept called working in, which is things that are like Tai Chi, Qigong, gentle breathing. The concept of a work in exercise is by definition, it's any movement that produces more energy than it costs to do the exercise. Yes. So I created a whole series of very simple energy, life force, chi cultivating exercises, which are in my book, How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy. And I teach them in my training programs. But I, I'm bringing that up because when you have a well-integrated natural network, it's like a work-in system. It cultivates more energy than it costs to do the work of being alive. And that's one of the reasons I tell people it's so important to have creative outlets in your life. Because when you're, when you're in a creative pursuit, be it designing your own garden or painting or making music or doing something that's authentically creative, not just copying somebody else, then you're, by definition, you're adding life to life. And when you're adding life to life, then life flowers, it blossoms and, and your creativity explodes and you realize there's always solutions. And I think, you know, what we're talking about today is, is a solution to a lot of the world's problems. Oh, it sure is. I mean, permaculture in another way stated, it's expansive food. It's food, a food forest by its very nature is expansive. And I'll give you an example of that. My buddy, Chad Johnson lives on the tip of Lake Superior up in Minnesota where it's very cold. People ask, you know, I'm in Florida, but people say, I'm in Minnesota, I can't grow food. Well, yes, you can. And here's an example. He's got five acres. He started about five years ago. He's got so much food growing on his five acre property that he's got animals coming in that have never been documented in the United States. Four kinds of turtles, seven types of frogs, birds that are supposed to only be in Russia. And when we go in the forest around his property, he estimates that hundreds of thousands of plants have been planted by the wind and the water and the rain and the animals that have come into his system and then brought the seeds outward. It's absolutely magical. That's cool. Um you know, I recently read one of Dr. Mercola's articles, and I'll share the key points here for the listeners and and just to set the stage. And I'd love you to share your thoughts on these key points from the perspective of why permaculture is an ideal response to the issue, uh, the issues Dr. Mercola brings up. So I'll read the bullet points off the article, and then feel free to address any one of them or at one at a time or the whole shooting match. So um, the, the article was titled, How Bad Will the Food Shortage Get? Bullet point one. It's becoming increasingly clear that severe shortages are going to be inevitable, more or less worldwide, and whatever food is available will continue to go up in price. The cost of agricultural inputs such as diesel and fertilizers is skyrocketing due to shortages caused by a combination of intentional and coincidental events. And these costs will be reflected in consumer food prices and come fall next uh, come fall next year. Mysterious fires, alleged bird flu outbreaks, and other inexplicable events are killing off livestock and destroying cultural infrastructure. Since the end of April 2021, at least 96 farms and food processing plants and distribution centers across the U.S. have been damaged or destroyed. Can I jump in on the nutrient part, on the food part? Yeah, where which one? Uh, well, you mentioned the food. Um, there's a food shortage. If if we look at food as nutrients, as energy, there has been a food shortage in the way of nutrients and energy providing for decades. Yeah, probably since probably since the uh, end of the Second World War, because I'm sure you know they figured out that they could use their ammunition factories to make NPK fertilizers. And so they marketed that to farmers. And I think that's personally when soil destruction really began because they started playing tricks to make plants grow fast, but they destroyed the natural cycle. And of course, they threw the chemical balance of the soil out. And then as that started breaking down, they started producing more and more pesticides to deal with the weeds. 
But as you learn in soil science, there's two classes of weeds, broadleaf and narrowleaf, and each of them is there to remineralize the soil. And you're not supposed to kill them. You're supposed to let them do their work to balance the soil. Yes. When, when I was a kid, I remember seeing dandelions in my yard. And I said, Mama, look at the beautiful flowers. And my mom said, oh, those are really bad. Pick that. <laughs> right? <laughs> because that was the program of the day. Right? Yeah. Dandelions are most, the most incredibly nutritious plant we can have. And they also heal the soil. Once the soil is healed, then there are no more dandelions in that area. Exactly. So your, your point was that we're not having a food shortage now. We've had really a, a, I mean, the point of food is nutrition, but what you're saying is we've had a nutrition shortage for a very long time. Yes. And it's reflected in the health of society. It's very easy to see. If you look at a picture from the beach in LA 50 years ago, and you look at a picture now, you're like, what planet is that? It's a completely right. different shape of human. And then you also mentioned this, um, the, the stuff that's going on with the food supply chain. Back about 50 years ago, Henry Kissinger said, if you want to control nations, control oil. If you want to control people, control food. Now, why would anybody say that, especially somebody who has met with every U.S. president? Well, the reason why is because that's not just the ramblings of a madman. That's the strategy of the person that is carrying out the strategy. Right. Well, you know, I was a paratrooper in the 82nd Airborne Division, and the first thing they teach you in basic battlefield strategy is this. If you want to control your enemy, there's two things you got to do. Knock out their food supply and knock out their communications, and it's downhill from there. Since the beginning of the pandemic, I've been saying, pay attention, people, basic battlefield strategy. They're knocking out your food supply, and they're knocking out your communications. It's called censorship. It means we're being taken over from people who have no interest in our health. And if you believe anything they say is to protect you, then you're being, being trapped at another level. That's absolutely what's happening. This is war. And so the solutions, and this is because I, I really understand and understand the problem thoroughly at, at multiple levels because I've been obsessed. In fact, I, I, one thing that's changed my life is about 15 months ago, I was at the end of my rope and I had made $20 million. And when I found out what was going on in this world, I started losing money because I was living out of a form of scarcity. I was obsessed with the solution for the sake of my daughters and my future grandkids. And it was, I was literally went from 20 million to negative 80,000. I wow. had a $90,000 credit limit. I had no income because I had a good business at the mall, which I borrowed money. I got it all rocking. And then the mall, that whole thing shut down, not because of COVID, because of government. Uh, <laughs> government shut me down. So I was at the end of my rope and I was walking and meditating and breathing and doing the things you suggest. And I could feel this tightness in my right here and in my heart and my stomach. And I started crying and I started meditating. I just let it go. I said, I'm going to live with faith starting right now. I'm going to let go of all the fear and I'm going to live in this moment. And I'm going to follow the guidance that comes from the gap in between the thoughts. And from that day forward, it's been epic abundance. Yeah. Th yeah. It's, it's very interesting. Uh, there's lots I can say on that, but I don't want to stop us from hearing you talk. So I'll just say great job. And you know, I say when the pain teacher shows up, it's a good time to become a great student because if you drug it or ignore it, it just leads to a deeper crisis. Um, his next point was the global food index has risen 58.5% above 2014 20, to 2016 average of April as of April 22 due to a convergence of post uh, pandemic global demand, extreme weather tightening food stocks, high energy prices, supply, supply chain, bottlenecks, export restrictions, taxes, and the Russia-Ukraine conflict. Combined, all of these factors set, up for guarantee, set us up for guaranteed food shortages, food inflation, and potentially famine in some places. So now is the time to prepare. And that, we, we all know there's a lot of bullshit going on, a lot of trickery, a lot of manipulation. There's a global elite. They've got their own little sick agenda. And 
the reality of it is no matter how psychopathic they are, they do have enough money, enough power, enough influence to obviously change our lives. They locked us down over a illusion of a virus for two years and not, they didn't lock me down. They locked me a lot neither. of people down. I didn't wear a mask or any of that shit. I said, yeah. I don't play stupid games and I certainly don't let dangerous people dictate my life. Um, so, you know, really why I wanted to talk to you aside from the, the interest in permaculture, which I think everybody should know about is I think you have probably the most viable solution. And I say that because it's one thing to garden. And as my wife, Penny was just telling you about, you know, gardening's not always that easy because everybody else wants to eat your food, the pests of the, or the creatures. Um, but I also had, um, Michael Judd on my podcast, who's a permaculturist and has written a couple of beautiful books. And we talked about some of these things, but that was probably two years ago. So I've known about permaculture. Several of my students have gotten deep into it. We hired three permaculture consultants to come to our property and help us develop all our gardens and all of our orchards. So Angie, my other wife, works with a, a couple of different permaculture consultants to guide us. Hi, everybody. Have you ever wondered why your blood is red? It's because it's full of oxygen and life force. It's what keeps you going. But what if I could tell you about something else that's red that will add more life force and keep you going? And if you start with a red juice before you have coffee or tea and wait a few minutes, you might find that you either don't need the coffee or the tea or you need less of it. But this time, instead of getting coffee and tea, you got a lot of nutrition and a lot of great stuff for stress management and detoxification. And it's so important. I got Drew Canole. It took me two years to get him to come <laughs> hang out with me and talk about this. I said, Drew, tell me more about your red juice. And he is right here to tell us what is on with your red juice. My kids love it. Everybody I know loves it. Well, I love that we have it for kids because yes. when I was a kid, there was this big red dude that would burst through a brick wall and he was like, oh yeah, and he oh. would feed me a glass of 50 grams of sugar, <laughs> giving most people diabetes, yeah. ADHD, yeah. addiction, obesity, obesity, all the things, right? Mm. So when we created red, it was, what's the alternative? Mm -hmm. If we could create something that could create lasting stamina, lasting energy. And then we started to look at our ancient ancestors. Mm -hmm. We talk about the Vikings, mm -hmm. the people that were rowing across the oceans, oceans. for days <laughs> yeah. to go to war. Yeah. What were they taking? Well, they were taking rhodiola. Yeah. Rhodiola is in our red juice. Yeah. And then we were like, okay, so out of all the mushrooms, yeah. what's one of the best medicinal mushrooms that can give us long lasting energy? Mm. We found cordyceps. Cordyceps mm. are absolutely amazing. Yes. Not just any cordyceps or rhodiola, glyphosate residue free and organic. Mm -hmm. And how can we make it taste better then the, oh yeah, you yeah. know, how do we make it taste better than that without the sugar? Yeah. We added a little monk fruit. Monk fruit's amazing. Yep. And we found the best berries on the planet. Mm. Berries in, in high amounts, which we have in the red juice, actually help increase stem cell creation in your body. Mm. What's better than that for our little ones and for us? Yes. And so many people are just lethargic. They're lacking energy. Yes. What could we do for that? Red juice in the afternoon, 2 p.m. rolls around instead of a nap, instead of the coffee. Drink the red juice. You're going to feel so much better. Well, if you need the nap, take the nap if you can, but then take the red juice to kick you back into gear. Exactly. I love naps and yeah. I love coffee. I, I do too, but I love to make sure I got the nutrition in me first. You know, the other thing is berries are a natural stimulant to the adrenal glands. So mm. if people would do a little red juice before they do coffee and tea, they would pick themselves up naturally, except this time they're bringing in nutrition. And unfortunately, coffee blocks almost every vitamin and mineral you can put in your mouth. So Hey, there you have it, right from the man himself. If you're ready to get red with life force energy and vitality, go to Organifi.com. That's O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I.com. And to make it even better, use the code C-H-E-K-20, all caps, to get your 20% discount on checkout because you're a living 4D badass and we want you healthy. I love you. Bye-bye. I think what's important that you share, which I'd love you to elaborate on in response to what's going on. And, you know, I've got more questions coming up on this issue, so I won't let the whole cat out of the bag. But I think the real 
thing that you made very clear in your interview with Dell Bigtree and certainly many others is that it doesn't take a lot of space using permaculture and it doesn't take a lot of effort if the design is right. And if there's going to be food shortages and there are, the problem is most of, you know, I don't know what your stats are, but the last time I looked into this, the research I found showed that only four to 6% of all the food eaten in the world is organically grown. The rest of it's commercial. So in a sense, I think these food shortages and all this is a real blessing because it's going to put people in a situation where you either empower yourself and you go back to nature or you become a victim. And I think permaculture is probably the best overall solution. So maybe you can talk about what your response is. If Joe Mercola said to you, Jim, this is what's going on. It's going to be shitty. What would your response to this article and to Joe Mercola and everybody else be? Well, my obsession has been to find a way to catalyze a shift in consciousness that leads to mass adoption of this most logical thing and to wipe out all of the programming in the three levels of BS, the bad science, the belief systems, and the bullshit about growing food. People look at, um, and there's different types of growing, right? There's market gardening. Market gardening is a lot of freaking work. Right? And, and it's not the growing of the food. Nature does 90% of that. It's the harvesting and packaging and bringing to market. And then the worst part of it, and I've done this, it's the politics of the market itself. It's horrible. all the legalities. Yeah. Yeah. People it's sue you over everything. Oh my gosh, it's ridiculous. So we need to decentralize and we need to take governmente out of that process, right? Govern is to manage or control or steer and mente is mind, right? We need to mm. let go of the programming and do what you teach. Breathe, let the, let the, allow the mind and the thoughts and the programs to clear because we can never come up with a solution to a problem. If this is a thought and this is the thought and they're like this in our minds, we can't solve any problems, no. right? And then we sit and we ask with intention, what is the solution? And this is where another quote that blew my mind, and I've spent a lot of time, is uh, Victor Hugo. There's one thing stronger than all of the armies of the world, and that is an idea whose time has come. He didn't say a new idea. The Garden of Eden, this idea of enlightenment, is the idea whose time has come and we're in it. This is the apocalypse right now. Yeah. Right? And and the scam is that the apocalypse is a bad thing. It's yes. <laughs> right? They gotta keep it profitable. <laughs> yes. The apocalypse simply means lifting the veil. So we are helping people, inspiring and empowering them by demonstrating what's possible from a place of faith and courage and joy and love and abundance. And then people want that. So they say, oh Jim Tell me how to get some of that energy that you got. Okay, come over to my place and I'll show you my food forest that I don't spend any time managing. For two years, I've done not one thing. And I've got so much food there, I could feed, I could eat every meal for my family for the next perpetuity. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah, and you know, by the way, uh, I don't think there was a price on tomatoes or fruit and vegetables in the Garden of Eden. They were free. <laughs> Yes. Free for even the animals. That's it. If we just took the ornamental landscapes around the world and just added the functionality of food producing, and we took out the poisons. We have the poisons. Somebody just asked me the other day, Jim, how will you know when we've won the war? And I said, I'll know when there are no more poisons in our sky, in our water, in our soil, in our mines. That's when I'll know when we've won the war. Yeah. And it's going to take some effort because you know things like glyphosate take i think 75 years to break down if i remember right it's a long process okay so i i know a lot of this is a part that i love diving into what there's glyphosate everywhere now and nature is so powerful the soil is like the immune system of our planet when we build healthy soil it wipes out the poisons in a very short time and that's why they have to continuously add poisons because Mother Nature is so powerful. Yeah, I know with most real organic certifications, such as the Demeter associations, when you make an application and you pay your money, they send someone, a soil scientist, to test your soil. 
but usually there's a two to three year gestation period where the soil scientists work and guide you, but they won't give you your built your uh, certificate of of organic certification until the soils are clean. So there's that two to three year gestation period, and most of them can be metabolized by the microorganisms in two to three years. Um, I just came across studies in my research uh, on glyphosate that suggested that it was a lot harder of a chemical to break down than the other ones that we typically deal with. I don't know what you've heard in that regard. Yeah, there's one called something like Raison or Raison. And th there are some wicked ones. And that's what these entities are trying to do is create the most intense poisons to kill the most life. And so what we found, though, is when you put the right combination of plants you put compost tea and some worm castings and you start inoculating that soil with life and then covering it up, right? We never want exposed soil. Like we want to mimic nature. So you have ground cover on there. And when you let that process do its job, hemp, for instance, hemp takes radiation out of the soil and it mitigates. There's so many different ways to do it that the permaculture network has figured out. Yeah, that's a beautiful thing that I love about the permaculture and biodynamic farming too, that, you know, um, Steiner was very, very deep and really covered a lot of the bases. But I think most people just don't realize that people like yourself and people that really study permaculture, biodynamic farming, and even organic farming, they know that mother nature's toolkit can handle just about anything. I can't remember who I was interviewing. I was, um, I was talking to someone in one of my podcasts and they had actually been to Chernobyl and they said to me, do you know that Chernobyl was, was a place that was quarantined because of the high level of radioactivity, but after 20 years, it is now considered to be one of the healthiest places on the planet because nobody went in and disturbed it for 20 years. And so, you know, even a place with that level of poison healed itself to become one of the cleanest areas. And we saw right from the pandemic, from the lockdowns, nature started to respond and areas started to clean itself up. And there was all sorts of reports all over the world of miraculous things happening where there was, war, you know, um, reefs that were dying that were coming back. There was, you know, dead soil that was coming back. I mean, I think. I think a lot of us have been railroaded by false science to believe in false science and have lost touch with the science of nature or natural science. Yes. The science, the, the ultimate tool of this particular war is emotions, is fear. The science of how to get us scared and humiliated so we're controllable. And then they add to that all that other crap, right? That's why the foundation of our freedom is faith and courage, knowing that we are more than this and that we cannot be harmed in the big we, right? Who we truly are. And that's for me, that was the most important shift that I, 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 I got to make. I figured it out somehow. Yeah, good. Um, in my library, I have some excellent farming books investigating health and disease from the 50s and 60s. Two of them highlight the fact that during the First and Second World Wars, approximately 50% of all the food eaten by people was grown in their backyards due to food shortages. And the authors highlight the fact that the rates of illness and disease plummeted during this period. But as soon as the wars were over and people went back to eating processed foods, the rates of illness rose right back up to previous levels. Um, and we know what's happened since the end of Second World War. We just touched on it. I also have a book, a very good book. If you haven't got this book, it's really worth getting and reading. It'll blow your mind. It's called Farmers of 40 Centuries by Professor F.H. King. He was an agricultural professor, professor sent by the U.S. government in the early 1900s to investigate how it is that countries like China, Japan, and Korea we're able to produce so much food on such a small land mass because only 13% of China's whole land mass is arable. But they produced at that time, you know, this is early 1900s, they were producing a ton of food. Dr. King's investigation showed the average Chinese farmer could produce more, as much or more food on one and two thirds of an acre as the average American farmer could on 40 acres of land. And 
you know, I bring this up for a couple of reasons. One, Bill Gates telling people, oh, the population's too big. We got to reduce the population. We got to stop animal farming and all this horse shit. I'm like, you don't know anything about farming. You don't know anything about medicine. You, you just have more money than your brain cells can handle. And it's causing <laughs> us all to be poisoned. You know, as one guy said, if you can't keep viruses out of your own computers, what makes you think you can help this one? <laughs> oh, God, there's some funny stories I got about that. But anyway, keep going. <laughs> yeah. So um, could you give us some idea of how much food or what percentage of a family's food can be produced in the following scenarios? So those that have uh, no patio, but maybe live in an apartment or high rise building, but, but could possibly put a small planter box, or maybe even if they had two bathrooms, two bed, two tubs, they could devote one tub to, to, to like a little greenhouse type thing yep. with some even grow lights if they had no choice. Oh, then people that have um, maybe a patio. Um, I remember uh, years and years ago, my, my first son's 42 now, but when he was like 15, after his mother and I got divorced, I remember coming over and find he had all sorts of pot plants growing on the patio and they were growing like crazy. I mean, his own little pot farm out there, yeah, yeah. which unfortunately um, resulted in the neighbors above looking down, calling the cops. So oh, that ended, no. that ended his, uh, his uh, marijuana permaculture project. <laughs> but the, the point is, is I went, wow, this kid's growing a lot of stuff out here on the patio. And I think that's a real option for a lot of people. So people have balconies, and apartments and condominiums, and you got your average backyard. Then you got people with a half an acre to an acre. Our last house in Vista had uh, half an acre. And there was, you know, we had six fruit trees. We had garden beds. I mean, we were, we got a lot of food off that half an acre, but we weren't even close to doing a food farm like you would do. And so my, my goal here is to say, look, there's a lot of people that are going to get caught with their pants down because they're not next to farms they're not next to water sources. So I think realizing what you can do in each of these circumstances from the permaculture perspective could give people some security. Yep, exactly. And you know, when the Russians pulled out of Cuba in 1989, the Cubans were starving within 10 years. They were the most, one of the most food self-reliant countries on the planet. Right. Yeah, they actually have the highest rate of organic food consumption per capita in the world. Yes, isn't that beautiful? And it's, it was because they had to. So now more people are growing food now than ever in history. It's, it's expanding very rapidly because the need is becoming ever more apparent every day. And yes, so there are 44 million acres of lawn in the United States. That's our target audience is the American lawn. When yeah. we can turn half of that into regenerative ed edible landscapes, taking out the poisons, we reverse deforestation, we reverse mass extinction, we reverse cancer, heart disease, diabetes trends, we end hunger, and we take out the foundation of tyranny. The most, like you said earlier, the, to the primary tools of enslavement control the mind, control the resources, and the food is at the crux of that. It's the most important, one of the most important things. So. What can you do? Well, the marijuana farmers have shown us that we can turn closets into grow rooms. And it's <laughs> so simple, right? You go to, go to um, Home Depot and you buy a little LED light. And I like using, uh, and this is one I don't see much, but essential oil diffusers are fantastic, right? They don't take hardly any energy and neither do the LED lights. Put some um, bright paint on the walls or some flashing material and you can start with five gallon buckets. Yeah. You can get all this stuff for pretty much for a hundred bucks. You could be growing, and my favorites are potatoes and sweet potatoes, especially sweet potatoes, because they're so prolific, they're so nutrient dense, and you can eat the, the stems, the leaves, and the tubers, but there's so many more functions of a sweet potato. You can actually take off one of the slips you can put in some water or you can even just stick it in some good dirt. And now you've got a new sweet potato start. Uh, so it doesn't need to be seeded. It just, it just, you can take a piece of the sweet potato. Yes. And that's what I like to share with everybody because there's a major food supply chain disaster that I believe is going to hit late summer. And then by winter, I think it could be 
really, really rough on people who aren't willing to take these steps. But for people who are willing to position themselves as the solution for their friends and family and their community, it's so easy to scale this. And, and in fact, I had a guy that's high up in Sri Lanka call me up and said, Jim, we need some help. And I, and I said, I asked him a few questions. He's going to get together. He said the Buddhist community over there, he said they're kingmakers. They are very influential. I said, OK, I would like you to get me somebody high up in that network, in that culture, also some politicians, some influencers, and, and I want to have a, a Zoom meeting. If we could start propagating sweet potatoes and papaya and bananas and yucca and basically five different foods, you could literally create food security in Sri Lanka within two years. That's fantastic. So basically what you're saying is what I'm trying to get out of you is if someone, what percentage of your food needs, what, how much space does it take to meet the food needs, say, of a family of three? So there are examples around the world. There's one in California that's very popular on YouTube. Um, family grows 6,000 pounds of food in their tenth of an acre yard. Wow, that's a lot. And that's not a lot of space. A tenth of an acre, what is that? In That's 4,000 square feet. Okay, for, so about the size of the footprint of a house. Yeah, for a, a good size house, 4,000 square foot, boom. You've got enough area to grow all the food you need. And that's, they, they use it as a market guard. They also make 20 grand a year off of selling it, right? So they're making that very intensive. And most of that is annual crops. Now we're a fan of a combination of annuals and perennials. Annuals like tomatoes and cucumbers and squash, and you plant them, you, you harvest the plant and the seed, and then you take the seed and you plant again. Well, perennials are plants like fruit trees and berry bushes and plants that you plant once like there's an olive tree on the Greek Isle of Crete that was that germinated over 2,000 years ago, and it's I saw the picture olive. of it in Dell Big Tree's presentation with you. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? I was surprised how big that thing was. I know. It looked like an oak tree. Yeah, it did. So perennials are our favorite for the long-term solution of complete freedom and wellness for our society. But we also really need to plant annuals now as well because they produce a lot faster than perennials. Hi, you guys. I know you all know that super green powders are good for you if they're made from organic sources and they're processed properly so the nutrients are there. And that's exactly what Paleo Valley does with their super greens powder. So I brought Autumn Smith in to tell us exactly how she created it and why and what it's going to do for you when you try their amazing organic super greens powder. Autumn. What is the magic you've got here? Well, like you said, we all need to get more of those micronutrients that you find in fresh fruits and vegetables. And so we've created a powder that you do not have to choke down. It has an absolutely delicious berry lemonade flavor. And the reason that it's different is because A, it is all organic, 23 organic superfood ingredients. And B, it is a very, very gut-friendly product because what I've found in my practice is that a lot of people don't do well with cereal grasses. And we know cereal grasses, like wheatgrass, can contain lectins that can be hard on the guts of a lot of people I work with. And so what we did was we created a a cereal grass free alternative. We use high quality, the cleanest, highest quality spirulina on the market, raised in India. And then we added the 22 other organic fresh fruits and vegetables, and the flavor will surprise you. So, all you have to do to check it out is go ahead to paleovalley.com. That's P A L E O V A L L E Y.com. And you can use the code CHECK15, that's lowercase c-h-e-k-15, at checkout. My son drinks it every day. We call it his ninja juice, and I sincerely hope your family loves it as much as ours does. All right, everybody. Go paleo green and get rocking. Hope you love it. You know, Bill Gates has been trying to get rid of seeds of anything other than the ones he and Monsanto produce. I heard from a reliable source that he has a massive, massive warehouse somewhere, I think way up like near the North Pole or someplace where he's stockpiling millions and millions and millions and millions of seeds and uh, basically trying to make it so nobody can grow anything without depending upon him. And, you know, 
I don't need to tell you what Monsanto did with all their genetically modified crops and all the farming failures in India. In fact, it was so bad, um, the number one rate of, of suicide was amongst Indian farmers because they trusted Monsanto, lost everything, and couldn't feed their families or pay their debts, so they found it easier to kill themselves. So the question I'm leading to is, how important is the quality of the seeds you buy, and where do you suggest people get good seeds? The best place to get good seeds is at your local nurseries, the nurseries where there's passionate growers, right? Lowe's and Home Depot, they're not the best place to get seeds. But if that's the only place, then go for it. But when you can go in and talk to somebody who grew something from that particular seed and then brought harvested seed from their own plants and then brought those and they packaged up and sell them, those are gold. And you can oftentimes, you can even taste the product of the seed. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Good, good suggestion. I, I wanted to ask about that because the whole seed thing's getting to be part of the trap they're weaving. And if you don't know where your seeds are coming from, you could end up with genetically modified plant seeds. And, and that's not a good idea. Yeah. You know, there's one other really important point I'd like to share. There's a lot of people that really their funds are dried up because of whatever circumstance and all the things going on. So if, if you go to the store and you look at the different foods that you like, tomatoes and cucumbers, whatever you like, even perennials like apples and pears, you can buy them from the organic section and you can actually then harvest the seeds. You can still eat the food. So with 20 bucks, you can go and you can start your own garden and you can still eat the food. That's really good. Yeah. Thank you for that. That's a great tip. I mean, it's pretty obvious. I don't know why I didn't think about it, but if I'd thought of everything, I wouldn't have a chance to hang out with you. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so um, with the situation being what it is right now, if you were single, married, or had children and lived in a city where the only source of water was city tap water and your only so source of food was supermarkets, do you feel it would be wise to move somewhere where you and your family have access to clean spring water or well water, can grow your own food, or have access to local organic farms that provide food regardless of the situation in stores? Because I see a lot of people are, unfortunately, you know, a city's a bad place to be right now. And, you know, a lot of people are going to make excuses and they're going to end up paying for it. But I've been telling my students for a long time, you'd be really wise to get near clean water that's a reliable source that's not controlled, that you have access to, and to get near where you have farmers markets and local growers. We're fortunate because we're growing a lot of food here, but we have probably, I don't know, I would guess 30 or 40 organic farms and our farmers markets are really good and that's awesome with all the food shortages in the store penny said she hasn't seen any change in the farmers markets it's all pretty much business as usual and we started talking to the local farmers and saying okay you know what have you got what have i got so we're starting to network ourselves so that if the shit hits the fan and there's a financial crisis or a food crisis we can barter with people and 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 get by and 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 live a, a you know a decent life and probably even a better life. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. What's your thoughts for, for people with regard to what I just shared with access to food, water, and farms? Well, I think that it could be a life or death, death situation over the next 12 to 18 months, maybe sooner, that um, there, is, there could be a complete shutdown of the energy systems. It's happening just the other day in South Africa and all over the world, there are major issues and it seems like they're going to be happening. They're preparing the stage for them, those things to be happening here. So um, regarding living in the city, what I would do if I lived in a city and I didn't have the resources to move, I would get with friends, right? This is when we can come together as community and we can start sharing our resources and our knowledge, that's going to get us through this is creating local communities that we've got a, somebody who knows about technology, somebody knows about mechanics, somebody like the old days. You've yeah. got a blacksmith and a shoemaker and you've got a grower. Back then, everybody grew food, right? That was just the norm. Um, so yes, I would definitely start becoming friends with and seeing how you can serve your local farmers around. You know, being of value to them. In fact, 
I've had several people here that are incredible growers. I've got 52 acres where we're building a completely off-grid, beautiful community on a private lake with a runway. And I've invited several. I said, if the shit hits the fan, you've got a place to stay because they're of value. They're passionate. They're ethical. And they're, I feel like they're, they're, they're well, they're ethical. That's the foundation of it. They're moral. And, and they also know how to grow food. Yeah, that's really good. You know what? You brought a thought up in my mind. I think for people that end up, for whatever reason, having to stay in the city, it'd be a good idea to go to the website findaspring.com and map out all the natural sources of water. Even if you have to drive or hike or walk, find out where you can get water. Because if once you don't have access to water, and most of the water people are drinking in tap water is poisonous crap. And, it, and it's not even ideal for plants. Uh, I, we, we got our well in recently. And man, my gardener, he's been taking care of our 14-acre property for 20 years. And he said, Paul, I have never seen plants grow this fast in my entire life. Wow. The, we, we got lucky. Our well water is unbelievable. I've never tasted water like that in my life. And it's just jacked with energy. And it actually has a natural sweetness to it. It's crazy. That's we cool. put it in my cold plunge. And when I lay in the cold plunge and close my eyes in my third eye, it looks like photons bursting in every direction. Yeah. It's the wildest thing. So I, I think because of the primacy of water for survival, for cooking, for everything, uh, people would be really wise to get clear on where you can go to get water that other people probably won't know about or will be too lazy to go to and start stocking up. I tell people you should probably have at least three to five, five gallon bottle, glass bottles of water uh, that's good quality water saved in a cool, dark space. Yes. In fact, I just wrote down that. I'm going to share that website with our network. That is just beautiful. Yeah. Findaspring.com. Yeah. And the other thing that I very much love is my Berkey. Yeah. You know, in fact, I've got a plan where if anything is coming, I'm taking that Berkey out the house with me. <laughs> if I have to run, because now I've got good water anywhere I go, you know, yeah. as long as I can find some water, even if it's crappy water, you run it through the Berkey and it's going to be pretty good water. Yeah. We're fortunate too. We've probably got, I would imagine it's, Oh, if a, our pond is full, it's probably a half an acre, but it's got a lot of bullfrogs. I mean, hundreds of bullfrogs and these things, some of them are like two pounds. You can, you could eat them. Wow. We're going to, we're going to put more fish in there too, but there's that, you know, knowing where ponds are, where rivers are, you know, things that you can live off of is very, very important right now. Oh, it's so and a fishing pole is one of the best preparedness tools in the world. You can if you've got water, you can almost always get a sunny or a perch or a bullhead, you know, let alone a bass or a walleye or a muskie. Um, yeah. so yeah, those are great tools. Um, yes, definitely. How important do you feel water quality is when one when watering one's produce uh and for drinking, if you have any suggestions in either regard? I think it's incredibly important. Um, rainwater, rain is number one. Rainwater catchment, which is rain, is also awesome. Um, and then well water. And what I don't like to use is reclaimed water or city water. Now, if you don't have a choice, if you have to have city water, then get a filter. There are some awesome filters. There are restructuring devices. There are that you can even put them on the end of your hose where you can start watering with some of this water that's more restructured, it's more alive. Yes, I did a great podcast with Dolph Zentinga, who's one of the world's leading experts on water. And he produces a product called the Analemma Water Wand, which is a magical piece of equipment. You can just, no matter, you, you could do it in a five gallon bucket, you can do it in, in, a, in a thermos, but you just spin this, it looks like a, about the size of a thermometer, about, about this length of a dollar bill. It's a glass tube. He worked for many years of research to develop this highly structured water that's so stable it can even go through airport security systems, x-rays, and it doesn't damage the water in it. But it instantly structures just by stirring it back and forth for maybe 30 seconds. It structures the water. You can taste and feel the difference immediately. 
That's amazing. So that's called the Analemma Water Wand. If anyone's interested, just go to my podcast with Dolph Zantinga. Look in the um, show notes and you'll find the information you need. Jim, that's something you might want to check out too. Yes. In fact, I just saw the first water wand just about a week ago. So you know how you said when you hear some, about somebody three times, you're in? Now that I heard it from, from two people, I'm in. I'm going to check that out right away, and I'm going to get one of those systems. Actually, if you'd like, I can introduce you to him. He's really a lovely man, and he's oh, a please. genius. He's someone you want to talk to for sure. That's fantastic. I would love to chat with him. Yeah, if you just help me, remind me by an email or something, I'll write it down. Uh, Dolph, Jim. Um, Dolph Zantinga, Z-A-N-T-I-N-G-E. Lovely, lovely man. I really enjoy every chance I get to dialogue with him. Awesome. Very, very smart guy. Um, uh, pets and creatures can really rip through a garden fast, as we've been talking. Um, we've had rabbits and squirrels feasting in our garden beds, even though they're caged in, and the squirrels have figured out how to eat squash right through the wire and wow. find ways to get inside. Um, do you find uh, permaculture food forests more resistant to loss to bugs and creatures, or do you still have to use protective webbing and things like that? So we have, like at our property here, we've got over 200 different types of food growing. And we become, if we don't have a good apex predator, the hawks and the cats and all the different things that come into a system to help balance it out, then we simply have to be that. And we could do that by eating, consuming those animals or killing them, or we can plant the right combinations. And in fact, here's a good example. My friend Chad that I was mentioning, they've got bear and moose and wolves and lots of deer. He's got ras barriers around his property oh. that are eight feet tall and you can't see through them. I don't know how thick they are, but nothing goes through those raspberry bushes. Yeah, that's a right. painful process. <laughs> yes. So there's a permaculture way. And what we do in permaculture is we say, okay, here are the 10 ways that people have dealt with this particular issue. Maybe it's a little electric fence or um, an electric mesh webbing or something like that. So we stack in the functions and the different possibilities, and then the customers choose what's best for their situation. Yeah, that's good. I'm, I'm going to uh, encourage Angie. Uh, my I, my other wife Angie, she's her and Penny do a lot of the gardening, but Angie's the one that's in contact with the permaculture expert. So I'm going to have her look into making sure we're using all the permaculture tricks we can, um, because you know we we live on top of a mountain and, and it's kind of we're out in the middle of you know way out away from town and everybody around has big plots of land and. So there's a, there's a lot of animals out here. And, you know, I was saying to Angie, I said, the uh, squirrels and rabbits and creatures on the property must be going, wow, these people must really love us. Look at how well they're <laughs> feeding us, you know, because all of a sudden, you know, for the first time ever, there, there's all this food around, you know, instead yeah. of being this kind of, you know, hot California desert environment. And they're plowing their way through it, as Penny was telling you, they're stripping everything you know that they can get their hands on um so it, we'll have some fat squirrels to eat if we get hungry exactly you'll, you'll be there be like your livestock that you don't have to fence and cage you'll just you feed them and um so fences are great too a lot of people don't want to put up fences or they have fences like chain link but they're not using them to their proper function a chain link fence like we just put in a three thousand foot chain link fence and we've got a new vining plant every eight feet. Yeah. We could do eight, we could do like a thousand bottles of wine a year off of that fence. Right? Yeah, that's great. I've got a, yeah. uh, I've got grapes growing along the fence behind my house. They love it there. And uh, Angie planted runner vines. I have a Olympic volleyball court that I turned into my rock stacking area because I can close it and the kids can't get in. Cause these, I build these huge rock stacks, you know, 12, 15 feet tall. And, and some of them are dangerous. If a kid hits them, they can come down and, and that would be the end. So she planted these runner vines all around it. And eventually it's just going to be this beautiful flowering, gorgeous, you know, volleyball court. That'll be awesome. So I, you know, there's uh, beans like runners too, don't they? Green beans. 
Absolutely. Some beans are really good for running. Dragon fruit in your area, passion flower, and there's even perennial lettuces that love to turn fences into trellises. I'm going to tell her to look into that and make that a, a, a food fence. Yes. Hi, everybody. I hope you're enjoying the show. I imagine you know that magnesium is one of the minerals that people in North America are the most efficient in, but it's an extremely important mineral to have in your diet regularly. And believe it or not, Bioptimizers has improved what was already well known to be the best magnesium formula out there called Magnesium Breakthrough. So I've got Wade Lightheart with me to explain what it is they've done to improve this already excellent formula. Wade, what is new about your new Mag Breakthrough formula? Well, it's called sucrosomial magnesium. So we have seven different types of magnesium in Magnesium Breakthrough because they're uptaken by different parts of the body. But a new type of magnesium has been created called sucrosomial. And what it shows in the research and science is that it's actually even more absorbable by the body, particularly inside of the brain, which is a big aspect uh, to enhance neurotransmitter formation, as well as ensuring the rest and relax response in the nervous system that a lot of people will take magnesium for. They find it, you know, clocks them down, helps them sleep better, allows for the relaxation of striated and smooth muscle tissue in the body, which creates an energetic relief. And so when we added sucrosomial, we were able to demonstrate inside our lab facility that we were able to get better improvements. Of course, we have a partnership with the Birch International University. We have some patents we're working on, uh, which will kind of relay some of these things. But sucrosomial was a no-brainer when we added to the formula, improved the results or improved the uptake. And the reports back from our testing team were like, wow, this we get more results with less caps. And that's always the goal for our company. That's excellent. I love it. I, I always say, and people have probably heard me say it before, I just am so amazed how you guys are constantly and always improving and working your best to not only make better products for us, but it doesn't seem to me that it gets more expensive as you make them better. So that's a real gift to the world. Thank you. Where can people get their new magnesium breakthrough formula? All they need to do is go to www.magbreakthrough.com slash living4d. Put in Paul 10, get 10% discount on your first bottle. And of course, if you order multiple bottles, you can get an extensive discount on that as well. And like everything else we sell, 365 day money back guarantee. If this isn't the best magnesium you've ever taken in your life, we demand that you tell us and we can give you your money back. But I think you're probably going to demand, hey, can I get more of this? <laughs> that, that's probably more the truth. So that's mag, M-A-G, breakthrough.com forward slash living number four, and then the letter D, code Paul 10. Enjoy deeper relaxation and better nutrition with Mag Breakthrough. Now, I, I touched on this uh, a bit here. I've, uh, there's a lot of research on EMFs and 5G having negative influences on plant and tree growth. And I talked to Dolph Zantinga, and his research showed conclusively that 5G actually kills water and turns it into dead water. And he expressed tremendous concern about the launch of all these 5G satellites. There was 42,000 of them, but they said there's going to be over 62,000 in the next couple of years. And, and and he's worried that it could actually kill the waterways and the oceans of the world. Um, we are using my Angie's an expert at biogeometry. She's done a lot, all their advanced training. So our whole property is done in biogeometry, which I think is part of the reason for the rapid growth. That's what I was going to say. Yes. Yeah. I've, and in fact, if you're into biogeometry, I have two podcasts. Uh, my first one with um, Ibrahim Kareem, the founder of biogeometry. And his daughter, Doria, is my fifth overall ever listened to episode. And then a second one, which was answering a lot of people's questions with his daughter, Doria, who she's a genius. And I just recorded my 200th episode with um, <clears throat> Ibrahim Kareem on his new book, which I think you'll find fascinating. Awesome. So my, <clears throat> excuse me, my question is, have you got any experience on making modifications with approaches like biogeometry to mitigate the ne negative effects of EMF pollution, 5G. Um, and what are your thoughts on, on the importance of that, especially for people in cities where there's just tons of EMF radiation and 5G antennas everywhere? 
Well, I have a lot to learn about that particular subject, about the geometry and that. But I do, I have pretty good study in the 5G and these different frequencies. And I'm a, I mean, Tesla said, if you want to find the secrets of the universe, think in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration. And I'll change one word. I have an upgrade to that quote. Experience or feel in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration. Because mm -hmm. we can't really think in terms of feeling, right? We just got to right. go right to the feeling. And what my belief is regarding a food forest, regarding a, a living system, is that when you actually give it enough love and you really work with it, that it will repel all of these negative forces, right? That's been my direct experience. In fact, I'm still kind of blown away. We've got this incredible food forest on 52 acres with woods on all sides, deer prints all around. And we've got 200 and some types of food and we're not getting, I don't really understand why, quite frankly, but it's just thriving and there's no, nothing's bothering it. Like, That's great. It's, yeah, it's kind of mind blowing. I, I, I still want to figure that one out, but I don't know if it's above my pay grade or not. <laughs> well, that's what meditation is for. And that's what asking your soul to guide you to the answers and show you the secrets is all about. That's how I do it. Yeah. We touched on this a little bit. You just did, but I'll state the question, let you expand more if you'd like. Um, during the first and second world wars, men left the farms to go fight in the wars and women took over farming and the record books show that crop production increased significantly in the hands of women. These findings and a number of other studies I've researched, such as Harold Saxon Burr's book, Blueprint for Immortality and The Secret Life of Plants by Peter Tompkins and Christopher Bird, show very clearly that plants and trees are very sentient, are aware of us their, and their caretakers and respond positively to being loved and appreciated. My question is, is there a psychological or love component to permaculture? And what are your thoughts on this regard and in general, which you kind of alluded to just a second ago? Uh, totally. I think that the scale of emotions is correlated with the vibrational energy that we are, right? Shame is right next to death, you know, and, and rage is a lot more forceful than shame, a lot more energized than shame, right? But it's still below the level of consciousness. And when once we can get to that level of willingness, of faith, of courage, and then expand our vibration, then I know for certain based on my life experiences that we we affect the field exponentially as we come into the present moment and we think in terms of the most incredible selfishness which is love service yeah. right when, when when it starts becoming such a joy to serve the world family everything to love it, and it, it all comes back and it becomes this incredible energy circle that you can feel like I can feel it when I see people, you know, and it shows where they're making energy come out of their hands. I like, I, I think that's probably possible. <laughs> oh, it is possible. Of course it is. Yes. I mean, I've been in this healing work for my whole career and, you know, long story short, it is very true. And, and my wife, Angie's a shaman, a very powerful healer. And Awesome. I've watched her work. I'm I'm clairvoyant. I can see her channeling light right through her crown chakra, right into her hands, right into people's bodies and taking pain out of them and doing wild stuff that most scientists would say is impossible. But that's because people don't look at the deeper science that they've repressed, which I have a library full of. So I, I think there's a lot there. You know, it's there, you know, love is the bonding force of the entire universe. Yes. Yeah. So, um, look, Jim, if you were going to die tomorrow and could use this as your last chance to get a message to the people of the world, considering what's going on at present, what would your message be? Well, Napoleon Hill, after studying the greatest minds, the most influential minds in the history of the world, came to a conclusion. Whatever the mind of man or woman can conceive and believe, it, it can, can achieve. achieve, right? And so I've taken that as one of my core kind of quotes in the form of a question. And the question then back to me is, what can my mind conceive and believe? And over the last 15 years, I can conceive and believe. And therefore, I've created an incredible strategy 
with the, of course, the help of all the teachers that have come into my life at the right times and the openness and willingness to engage with these teachers, um, that we are going to succeed. And it's going to be a, a struggle for a lot of people. Me, I'm not going to struggle one bit through this process. I've had um, many good friends, that a lot of names that you know, that have said, Jim, aren't you concerned? Because I go after them. I go after Gates. I go after all these people. And I, uh, for instance, um, well, Buffett, just he wrote an article today. He's got $97 billion. and He's going to put it out to the world or he's going to give it to Gates or somebody like that. And I said, Warren Buffett. If, if you want to really do good with the world, if you took $50 billion, you could put $1 million food forest demonstration sites in 50,000 places around the world. That's more than five new nurseries, five new education sites showing what the Garden of Eden actually looks like, showing what sustainability looks like in every city around the world. And I'm going after all of them. Because I know that we are going to help do our part to inspire this shift in consciousness. And then the strategy, which I'd like to share here before we're done, is, is really where it's getting very exponential and exciting. Yeah. You know, when Donald Trump gave a $2 trillion stimulus package for COVID, I said, that is the most ridiculous corporate manipulative bullshit strategy I said to people, do you realize what would happen if we used $2 trillion to teach people for doctors how to create happiness, how to move their bodies, how to plant, grow, and eat real food, and they understood the science of rest and how to use quiet time and introspection and spiritual practices. We would have, for $2 trillion, we could have revolutionized the entire world into harmony with nature. We could use that money to educate people on how to use technology in ethical, moral ways and safe ways. And I'm watching people thinking it's the greatest thing. I said, you have no idea what the interest on that loan is. It, oh, it's it's unbelievable. Uh, so I'm 100% with you. Yeah. Um, Th that system's going down now. Thank God. Yeah. You know, exactly. it, might, it might be bumpy, but you know what? Sometimes you an initiation is an initiation. and those people that have lost touch with natural principles and natural healing and have fallen in the trap of believing mainstream science about everything without questioning it, it's their time to become an adult now. And that means to become self-sufficient. And they're going to find that most of what they were taught just simply is not true. As many people that got vaccinated are finding out the hard way right now. Those were the questions that I laid out. Is there something else you would like to share uh, before we just ask you to share your websites and things like that? Yeah, I'd like to share kind of the magical story about what's happened. And the Newtonian physics could not describe the last 15 months of, of my life. So we launched on the highway with Dell. I get a call about a month later from the producer of The Crocodile Hunter. And that was my favorite show, right, for 10 years of my life. And they, they said, his name was Frazier, him and his mom, Judy Bailey. Um, he said, Jim, we would like to do a show with you and showing your vision for society. And I said, yep, because I'm expecting these calls. Like, I expect, um, I expect to get a call from Joe Rogan any minute. I expect Good. to get a call from Tony Robbins any minute. I expect to get a call from these people because we have the answer. So... Um, then I get a call two days later from Adrian Grenier, who was my favorite actor for 10 years of my life, like the next decade, right? In my thirties. And we put together a TV show called the land of plenty. Great. Yes. And it's amazing. So that was one little, like, that's a relatively small thing compared to all the things that have happened. I had a woman come to me and say, Jim, I love what you're doing. How can we be involved? Her name was Alova. She had no last name. Alova means noble love. Beautiful. And yes. And she and I said, well, why don't you help us put food in the ground? Because it's one of the most incredible businesses in the world right now is to help people put food in their yards. And she said, I'm in. So she became a food forest partner, a cooperative partner. And then she she started telling the world what she's doing. And her friend calls up, who represents a mega billionaire. And she said, I love what you're doing. Is there any way we can help? We could put in 50, 100 million, even more. 
100 billion or no, 100 million, 50 or 100 million. And Alova calls me up and she said, what would you do if you had 100 million dollars? I said, we'd put food forests in schools and use them as education demonstration sites and nurseries for their communities all throughout the United States. She calls her friend. They said, yes, we're going to do it. So a couple months go by. They're in the middle of a bunch of processes and stuff now. Alova dies. Oh. Right? She has a brain or she transitions, really, right? She has a brain aneurysm and she goes to the other side like Obi-Wan Kenobi. And the funder calls up her partner, Pat, and she's and she says, Pat, we're gonna do this, this, um, we're gonna donate this money so you can put food force in schools in the name of Alova. Right now, on. Now let's go back, go in history 50 years and look back on this. The most important catalyst for change in our world, a donation that was made in the name of love. Yeah. You like what's going on here? Hi, everybody. I hope you're enjoying the show, and I've got something great to share with you. I think you've all heard plenty in the news about zinc, but what you haven't heard about is Symbiotica's amazing new zinc complex, which is all organic and a unique formulation. And so because Shervin's the expert and the formulator and the founder of Symbiotica, I brought him in to tell us about the zinc complex and when we know we should use it because of the symptoms we're having. So, Shervin, how do we know we need this complex? You know, zinc, I'm a mineral guy. Yeah, you know? I know. <laughs> it's Thank like, God. <laughs> yeah, hallelujah. I mean, minerals are the root foundation of thought, emotion, and we're actually being present in the physical body. Without minerals, nothing can happen. Vitamins can't operate. Functions in the body can't happen. Hormones can't be made. You know, minerals are everything. And zinc in particular is very unique. I mean, think about it. They dip steel in zinc to keep it from corroding and rusting. That's called yeah. galvanization, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just think about what it's doing in the body. Zinc acts as a super antioxidant in the body from top to bottom. Yeah. If you're deficient in zinc, most likely you have low libido, mm -hmm. low energy, depression. You're not motivated. You might have flaky skin. Mm. You're probably not sleeping well. You're probably not metabolizing well. Zinc is so profound in the human body that it crosses almost every barrier in the body. What do I mean by that? It's in your saliva. Yeah. It's in your snot. Mm -hmm. It's in your piss. Yeah. It's in your sweat. It's everywhere. And why is that? Because the, our bodies are designed to operate with good zinc in the body. So mm -hmm. this formula is powerful. The results that we're having, the testimonials we're having, and just take it from me, this might be the most powerful formula we have at Symbiotica, and that's saying a lot. We have three forms of zinc in here. Two of them are trademark. We also have two forms of copper in here. Copper and zinc might displace each other. That's why we have to have the perfect ratios in there. Uh -huh. And then we also have selenium in there, mm. which creates the trifecta of these three critical minerals that we're not getting in our foods. Most people aren't eating oysters every day. Mm. And sometimes you just want to be able to reach in your cabinet and grab one little capsule I highly recommend eating this with your largest meal of the day mm. because it's that strong until your body app acclimates to it. I'm very, very happy about how this turned out and the results that it's having for both men and women. Excellent. You know, I know that uh, selenium deficiency is linked to uh, heart heart problems, holes in the hearts, heart valve dysfunction. Cancers. Yeah. Diabetes. Like, uh, on. New Zealand has a d deficiency of selenium in their soil and they were having a lot of problems with heart problems in the sheep there. Yep. And they tracked it to selenium deficiency. And I've also known of people that needed selenium to heal their heart. So what a great combination. So if you want to get your zinc complex, go to symbiotica.com, C-Y-M-B-I-O-T-I-K-A.com. And as a Living 4D listener, use the code CHECK15 on checkout and get 15% off your zinc complex and any of Symbiotica's amazing products. So enjoy and please take care of yourself. We all need to get our hands together and make the world a better place right now. So if your zinc complex and your Symbiotica products help us do that, then that's a worthy investment. Lots of love. Guys like Bill Gates and all of them, Soros, uh, what's his name that owns Kissinger. all the television networks? You got yep. Virgin, the guy from Virgin. Yep. These guys have enough money to completely stabilize everything. I mean, they say the Great Reset is to protect nature. I'm like, you guys own the very companies that are destroying nature. Don't even try that shit. 
then, they, oh, you're going to own nothing and be happy. My response is you first. Prove it. Exactly. Show us and what it looks like. Yes. You're talking about global warming. You're flying private jets everywhere. Yeah, exactly. And I'm going after them, every one of them. Elon Musk and this guy from the UN, a criminal organization, just had a, a funny debate. It was probably all staged. And they said, the guy said, if you put 2% of your net worth up, you could end world hunger. So Elon writes a check to the UN for $2 million. And what are they going to do with it? Poison the rest of us. So I actually went after Elon. I said, Elon, you want to change the world? You put $6 billion, which is 2%, into putting food forests in schools. You could put million-dollar food forest education centers in 60,000 schools around the world. That one thing would change the world. And I keep going and going and going. And now it's becoming, there's the momentum is absolutely epic. We have an event on the 2nd, 3rd, and 4th of July, which will change the world. Foster Gamble and Sayer G and uh, Andy, Dr. Andy Wakefield and Darren Olean, who won the Emmy last year. And all of these epic people are coming together. And we've got one simple message. David Holmgren is part of the group um, who was the founder of Permaculture and Greg Nibs and all these people. And the, we're doing four strategy sessions on the second, third, and the morning of the fourth. And we're going to put in the messaging with Emmy Award winners and some of the best messengers in the history of the world, right, that have proven it. And we are going to then do a live stream on the 4th of July at 3 Eastern. And it's going to go to hundreds of millions and then billions of people. Because it's going to be very simple, very to the point, and very inspiring. And people are going to take action. We're going to start getting in communities. We're going to start working on and playing with this growing food instead of lawns concept. Telling the poison producers, no, get out of my yard. I don't want that poison in my yard. Instead, I'm going to let nature do her thing. And so we're going to give direct action steps. And man, it's it's a lot of fun seeing this come together. Yeah, Foster Gamble is somebody I know and and uh, have connection with now and then i was on his show with kelly brogan he's a lovely man and um you reminded me of something i wanted to share one of my students who is named eric hulse who's a guy named elliot hulse's brother who's quite famous out there um eric hulse is a school teacher and he went through my holistic lifestyle coach training program and he went to his school where he teaches and started a four doctor club and they started their own gardens and they sing the four doctor songs and practice my four doctor model. And he sent me pictures of all the food they're growing and everything. And so, you know, I have to sing you my doctor diet song. Let's do it. Doctor diet, build your temple of body for your mind. Doctor diet, build your temple of body for your mind. We raise and eat our food with love. It makes our chemistry. We raise and eat our food with love. It makes our chemistry. Add good water and a smile be filled with energy. Add good water and a smile be filled with energy. Eat good organics and be wise. You are what you eat. Eat good organics and be wise. You are what you eat. You are what you eat. Yum, yum. Woohoo! <laughs> Man, that's awesome. <laughs> so I created songs that I teach my patients and my clients and my students because they carry the key principles of each of the doctors. I'll give you the other three for fun. Awesome. Dr. Happy. Dr. Happy is the dreamer. Dr. Happy is the dreamer. Dr. Happy is the dreamer, don't you know? Dr. Happy sets your rhythms. Your rhythm sets your pressure, and your rhythms and your pressure make your flow. And your rhythms and your pressure make your flow. Ho, ho. So, <laughs> Dr. Happy is the dreamer, baby. Dr. Movement. Dr. Movement animates life. Dr. Movement animates life. Dr. Movement is the sun and the moon. The sun and the moon. The sun works out. The moon works in. The sun works out. The moon works in. And that determines the temperature you are in. Woo! And that Woo! determines the temperature you are in. Woo! Woo <laughs> and Dr. Quiet. Dr. Quiet, she is yin. Know how she loves to bring energy in. 
Dr. Quiet, she is yen. Know how she loves to bring energy in. She teaches you how to rest so your energy is always at its best. Hey! <laughs> there you go. Man. I think I got Dr. Happy, Dr. Movement, Dr. Diet, and Dr. Quiet. Yeah, you did. I love it, man. That is that's, that's beautiful because it, it makes you smile. It just feels good. It feels uplifting. And that's what the world needs right now is uplifting from the, the depths of shame and all this CNN fear porn bullshit to like turn that shit off and go stand in a garden. Yes. You know? Oh, I do want to share that. This is so important. This idea that it's hard, that gardening is a time liability is a false narrative. Gardening is a time asset. The more you garden, the more time you actually enjoy of life and the more time you actually have. People currently, they'll go to work and they'll earn money. Then they'll go home, they'll get in the car again, and they'll go to the store. And then they'll shop around the store for a couple hours and bring home a pay for a basket of groceries. and then. All that stuff. Instead, if you spent a fraction of that energy, that financial and time energy on your backyard, you can walk out in your backyard. You'll save a lot of time, a lot of money, and the energy will infill. It'll fill you up with joy. And my kids love being in the garden. They, you know, Mona's six and Zoe, she'll be three next month, but they love to water they're always walking around eating the fruits and vegetables. They love watching the trees grow. I mean, if you got kids, talk about the best education in the world because they learn how life functions. They learn that there's a reciprocity. They learn that there's an exchange and they learn that you can't just keep taking faster than the garden can grow. You have to, you know, be realistic. You have to plan. You have to have a relationship with plants. I think most of what they're being taught in schools is a bunch of garbage. If they just really, I mean, I was raised on a farm. I hated school. I left in the ninth grade and said, screw this. I can't get my questions answered. And these people aren't teaching me things that I think are practical that are going to help me in my life. So I, I simply made it as uh, a, the way I educated myself is I found guys like you. I said, who's the best at this problem. And I went and studied with them or I took their workshops or hired them as consultants. And I spent probably the first 20 years of my career traveling all over the world. Who's the best at neck problems? Who's the best at back problems? Who's the best at nerve problems? Who's the best at spinal pathologies? Who's the best at gut health problems? Who's the best at mental emotional problems? That, that's just how I educated myself because I found most professors have never even practiced what they're professing. Uh, yeah. But when you go to the people that get tangible results, you already know you've got someone that knows how to do it. And, and you know, Mother Nature is a very good teacher. If you don't listen to her, she doesn't produce. If you do listen, she rewards you. And You just define permaculture. I mean, yeah. that is the definition is observe and interact and let the plants, let nature be our teacher. Yes. Yeah. Fantastic. Jim, thank you for all your love and your inspiration and motivation and what you're doing. And uh, I feel like I found a, a partner in, in, the, in the process of sharing love in the world. And uh, where can people find uh, any websites or anything you want to offer or any services you offer? Sure. So if anybody would like to grow food in your yard, then you can get a hold of us at foodforestabundance.com. We have a team of 45 designers from all over the world. And we design and install edible landscapes and food forests. And we do it in this, you know, somebody's got 400 square feet. We'll put a guild in. We do mini food forests. And then we do major. We've got princes of countries looking at our plans and asking us for more information right now. We got all these different things. Um, so we will love to help you grow food at home. And if you'd like to be in the business of helping other people grow food, it's an incredible business. If there's any landscapers or entrepreneurs out there or people who simply are handy and they want to be part of the solution of the biggest problems in the world, then we have a food forest cooperative business model. And a tiny backstory on this, I actually spent about a quarter million dollars getting a franchise ready. 
And I had the FDD, which was 244 pages, and the Ops Manual, which was 89 pages, and it made me sick to my freaking stomach. Mm. I threw the pile of crap in the trash, and we now have a two-page document based on the voluntary exchange of value. We have no non-competes, no NDAs, no pants, none of that stuff. We inspire people and empower people to grow food. And we create this, uh, it's called a Food Forest Landscape Blueprint. And it's very detailed. It's 45 pages. And within the document is the custom design for the customer, which can be DIY if the customer wants to, or that's where the cooperative comes in because most people are too busy or for whatever reason, they would rather hire somebody. And it's like, it's like a 40% margin business. So the average install is about 20,000. We do, we do them at 1500 all the way up to millions. So it's a good business. Yeah, fantastic. I bet you there's a lot of people in my audience that are going to take you up and want to come either start their own or get trained by you or join what you're doing. Um, in fact, one of my students loves being here and working on the land and helping out so much. He, he's, he's got a bus that he converted and he lives in a little school bus and he lives here on the land with us and he helps with everything and he just loves being part of it and growing food. And I think there's a lot of young people out there that are lost in video games and junk food that their whole life would change finding a guy like you and being involved and getting their feet in the dirt. And, you know, that's really living. I don't know who I'd be if I wasn't raised on a farm. I learned so much being on a farm and it gave me the foundation for the rest of my life. And, you know, I, I remember when I was in sports, I, I, I went to a little school kind of out in the country. And whenever we would play other schools, we would just kill them. And, we, you know, the thing I noticed at an early age is that the farm boys are harder working and they eat better food and they're badass athletes compared to yeah. the junk eating TV watching city kids. They're way and tougher. So I, I learned that from the very, very beginning, you know, I, I started wrestling when I was in the first grade, but I became a boxer and a kickboxer that sort of, I, I, I felt more in line with that. And then I became a competitive motocross racer and that's where my love was at and then got into drag racing and stock car racing and, you know, living on the edge of myself, which was <laughs> <laughs> quite fun. Yeah. Lots of broken bones and memories, but, uh, I won't die thinking I hadn't lived because I've tried it all. But yeah, what a great gift. I'm excited that you shared that. I'm really glad that you you offered that because I think there's just, I know within my own student base, I wouldn't doubt if you get at least 20 people that want to join you. I love it. Well, we've got one of the fastest growing co-ops in the world right now because the timing is right. The mission is right. The people are right. And the heart is right. It's it's just, we're, it's fun. And I, I like to share this too. We will not pay taxes to an entity that we are at war with. So we're putting it all back in, which is also a good business move. So, you know, so it's like a win. It's like, it's a win on top of a win. Every Everybody wins. Yeah, that's great. Well, I'll close by saying thank you to my sponsors for all of your excellent products, your sustainable products practices, your beautiful foods and supplements and the things that you make that I use every day or I wouldn't sell them. Thank you to all of you listeners for being part of the change. I hope many of you get excited and uh, join Jim and his permaculture movement, study permaculture. If you want to learn a little more, listen to my podcast with Michael Judd. We talk about that as well. Michael Judd has some beautiful books that might be helpful to you. Um, if you're financially capable of putting in a food forest, you now have someone who's an expert at it to help you. Um, where's that video accessible that, that shows you doing uh, Dell Big Trees Yard? I think everybody would love seeing that. Oh, yeah. It's uh, on our website, foodforestabundance.com. It's called Creating Abundance in Your Backyard. Yeah. So that's a great video. Um, yeah. And, and if you want to look at podcasts, Jim Gale podcasts, and there's like a hundred of them out there in the last year and a lot of fun communicating with everybody. Absolutely. Excellent. Well, thanks to all of you. We must be the change. Make the world a little better each day. Start with yourself and you know for sure you've made it better. And then share the love, find water that you can get access to, start growing things, even if it's in your 
spare bedroom, balcony, look into permaculture, just make a step in the right direction. And this is the greatest transition ever. And we can all make the world a really beautiful place together. And there's nothing better. We probably all chose to be here right now just for this amazing project. So I'll see you next time. Lots of love. Thank you for listening to Living 4D with Paul Check and today's guest, Jim Gale. You can connect with Jim on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, and YouTube at Food Forest Abundance. On his website, you can find more resources about building a food forest, book a consultation, and get a customized food forest design. You can also save 5% on any purchases by using the promo code PaulCheck. Go to shop.foodforestabundance.com forward slash PaulCheck. Enter Paul Check as the promo code when you check out to save 5%. That's P-A-U-L-C-H-E-K, all uppercase. Follow Paul Check on Instagram at Paul.Check, on Twitter at Paul Check, or on his YouTube podcast channel, youtube.com forward slash living 4 d with Paul Check. You can watch more on Paul's blog at paulchecksblog.com and get your free subscription to Czech videos and more at the Czech Institute's new media site, chekiva.com. You can read the show notes and find links to the resources mentioned in this episode at czechinstitute.com forward slash podcast. And if you enjoyed today's episode, please consider leaving us a five-star rating and a warm review at the top of the show page on Spotify or at the bottom of the show page if you are listening on Apple Podcast.